Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Uh, first up, we are doing, uh, we've got lightning talks from all of our poster presenters. So in a moment, I'm going to start handing the microphone uh, down the line and uh, all of the presenters are going to introduce themselves and talk for two minutes about their poster. I will be leaving a timer on the desk to remind you not to overrun. People in the front row, if you hear the timer go off, start clapping and uh, your time will then be up. Um, and so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Toby. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Toby. Uh, I work in the core team at the Carpentries, where I'm supporting a community of people uh, in the Carpentries who teach software and data skills, um, mostly to researchers all over the world. Uh, one of the other things that that community does a lot of these days is uh, developing new lessons on new topics using our open source lesson infrastructure. And the poster that we're presenting this week is about a pathway for those lessons um, to go through to peer reviewed publication. So uh, the poster describes a what we call a life cycle of lesson development that's somewhat similar to the kind of software development cycle that you, that you might be familiar with. Um, through to kind of open peer review and the possibility of publication in a journal. So please come along, uh, hear more about how you can get involved, and I'd love to talk to you there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, less than a minute. That's perfect. Uh, okay, next we have Crick. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Craig. I'm a civil engineer across the road at Northumbria University. Um, I spend quite a bit of my research trying to find time and resource to develop the open source code GPR Max, which has quite a sizable um, user base. And I guess like many of you, you know, finding challenges in, in different funding mechanisms um, to support the maintenance and development of software. And often find that, you know, the developments that we can do are kind of shoehorned onto the back of other projects, and there's never really uh, specific funding to do that. Um, although it seems that's maybe changing a little bit now, which is nice to see. Anyway, um, my poster is about our experience um, partaking in, in Google Summer of Code, which I'm sure lots of people have heard about. So we were lucky enough to be selected for two years, um, and across that time we had six students um, working on different aspects of GPR Max. And that was a really, really positive experience for the, um, for the code and for the mentors uh, and the students involved. So I'd be um, happy if you want to come and talk to me at my poster um, about um, aspects of that. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is Ramo Granay from Oxford University, and then I'm going to talk about First Sharing. First Sharing is a web platform that contains three key elements of the FAIR uh, ecosystem. You know about FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperability, and reusable of science. And then in our uh, platform, uh, we contain uh, standards, databases, and policies. And then you can try to find with databases, uh, implements a, a specific uh, standard. As you remember this morning, uh, Professor uh, Ferguson was commenting the importance of following uh, standards in, in some of the databases. Okay, and then uh, uh, the, all the platform was completely re re redeveloped in the last February, and then we also created an API. The back end was created in Ruby, the front end was JavaScript, and uh, we migra migrated the data from the old system to the new system. And then in the poster, I'm going to talk how we link and map uh, resources from uh, different resources, different places, like a repository of 100 organizations with our organizations and databases from another resources similar than ours uh, to, to, to our system. And then we use a kind of semi-automatic thing using um, human and automatic methods. More information in the poster. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, hi, so I'm Tim Booth from Edinburgh. Uh, for the last uh, year and a bit, I've invol been involved with the Ed Dash consortium of uh, a bunch of researchers around Edinburgh, uh, backed by a nice big chunky UKRI grant. And what we're doing is authoring a bunch of uh, new lessons on topics that are uh, both advanced but very practical. Uh, did I have a slide? Oh yeah, here you go, here's a list of them. Uh, and my personal involvement was in the uh, workflows in Snakemake course, but as you can see, uh, a whole bunch of things there, um, and they're generally uh, geared towards enabling open science. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so I've only got two, I promise. Um, and so uh, these are being developed within the uh, Carpentries Incubator, which conveniently Toby presented in the very first poster. Um, and uh, the, uh, the great thing about this is uh, that it really encourages uh, the lessons from the ground up to be uh, reusable, shareable, and uh, not just things that we're sort of making in-house for ourselves, but uh, things that the community is encouraged and anyone's encouraged to come and contribute to, uh, use our material, uh, contribute in the improvements of the material. Uh, it's all on GitHub, it's all open. And of course, uh, with this big uh, chunk of UKRI funding, we're also teaching a bunch of free courses just now. Uh, so uh, come and uh, sign up on the website and get them while they're hot. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Ed Bennett. I have a research background in computational theoretical particle physics, and I was given an ROC fellowship by STFC to try and improve reproducibility and open science in this area. I thought before I start doing that, telling people what to do, I kind of need to work out what's going on. Uh, so I skim read 1,229 papers on the archive. Um, Theoretical computational particle physics is really good because it does open science already in the sense that it's been doing preprints since the 90s. Uh, and it meant that I could do this survey of open science just by reading the archive and just by reading preprints. I didn't have to go and get lots of journal subscriptions. So the summary of what I found out is on the slide. Uh, so um, about 700 um, were non-cross lists, so they were actually in the archive. Um, about 600 generated new numerical data. Um, more than half of those acknowledge an HPC center. If you can acknowledge an HPC center, you can acknowledge the software you're using, but less than half did. Um, uh, of these, almost none published any data. Um, lots did cite existing data, which was good, but even fewer actually published their analysis workflow, which is what I'm supposed to be trying to enable as part of my fellowship, which just shows there is work for me to do, which is good. Uh, more detailed breakdown is on the poster. Come and talk to me tom tomorrow. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Maria Broadbridge. I'm from the University of Reading, and I'm here to introduce a new regional network in the UK south to you. So we're called RC South, and we aim to do what any regional network does. We aim to bring the community of RCs in the UK south together. So if you have anything on your badge that says South, Southwest, Southeast, this is the one for you. Um, our founding members are RC at UOR, which is based at Reading, then the Data and Software Engineering Group group based at Scientific Computing at SCFC, Southampton Research Software Group, and the UK Health and Security Agency, but I've already talked to some of you, so there's many more to add to that part. Um, please come and see us if you're anywhere in the South, if you're interested in joining the network, come and see us at the um, poster session, or come and find me or any of my co-authors, and we'll be so happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Miguel. I'm from King's Digital Lab. Uh, and our pro poster is about um, a tool an open source tool developed to analyze uh, research uh, ref, ref impact submissions. Uh, the, the tool takes as input PDF uh, documents, processes them, and then produce, uh, the results are available in an interactive dashboard. Um, the data is processed for mainly for topic classification, uh, semantic search, and entity extraction, using a mixture of uh, natural language processing, machine learning, uh, and geocoding. Um, then all of that is available in the dashboard, uh, so you can um, filter and search the documents, as well as having access to different types of visualizations. Um, the visualizations vary quite a lot, so they can be quite simple from 
simple bar charts just displaying counts um, or aggregations to more complex visualizations uh, showing the connections between uh, different data points. Um, the dashboard is being used uh, at King's College for for impact um, analysis, um, and the results so far have been uh, promising, even though there's no final uh, evaluation yet. Uh, for more details, please come and see the poster. Thank you. Hello. So, hello. My name is Sherman uh, from Queen Mary University of London. So, my poster will be on about paralysing. So, okay, um, paralysing or speeding up um, R packages or R code using C++. Uh, so, the RSC story goes that we have a researcher who has slow R code and it doesn't scale up to larger, larger data. So, one approach to solve this problem uh, was to re-implement the R code in C++. And you can see the bar chart, uh, that's the benchmarks. Uh, we have, uh, we could see significant speed up. So this is something called hybrid programming, which is programming in two different programming languages. Uh, one of the advantages of that is that you could do collaborative work. So you know C++, I know R, so we could work together to build a package together. And as another advantage is that if you have a huge R code base, you could pinpoint um, a bottleneck, a specific piece of code in R, and you can re-implement only that specific part in C++ to save resources and time. And we, and I personally believe that um, using RCPP in order to use C++ code in R would has the potential to have bigger, um, bigger impact or reach out to more researchers um, who, who who's not familiar with C++. Um, so thank you, and you could uh, talk to me further at the poster session. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Donald Carlin from Queen's University in Belfast. Um, so my uh, poster is really kind of interactive to have conversations and invite people to fill in a survey. So this all started with a, a Python course um, where I did a little workflow uh, for some of our researchers to take um, kind of toy Python code, um, put it on GitHub, then pop it onto Zenodo, get a, a CFF um, and a DOI, um, and other three other acronyms. Um, and I thought whenever I was doing this, I might as well check my institutional guidelines, which I kind of bitterly regret now. Um, so I wanted to check to see your other uh, two queens of guidelines about publishing software. Um, so I checked with the CTO of my institute, who's also our ref champion. Um, he didn't really know what I was talking about, so forwarded me on to a professor of software engineering. He said, no, not that he knew. He forwarded me on to research and enterprise, who do all of our IP licensing. They said, no, but just kept saying GPL3 to me. Um, then um, they formed me on the open access team, who are obviously experts in what they do, and they said, no, we all we know is about data. So I checked um, on Slack, um, and I was kind of prompted. I got two um, blinking eye emojis, which meant people kind of you know, validated what I said. And then also checked with um, Professor Caroline Jay from the SSI, who said, no, it's an interesting question. So it seems it doesn't exist, um, and I suspect it's the same in many schools and universities. So this survey seeks to formally enumerate any policies and get opinions on how this might help increase um, research software engineering outputs. The survey's only three minutes, please finish or uh, help do it. Um, at least half of it is ethics questions as well, sorry. Um, so why is this important? Well, at the same time as I was doing this, REF came out, software is massively down, as are all digital artifacts. So where is it? Um, so I refactored this as a use case. Um, as a, so as a researcher, um, I need to know that, first of all, I can publish research software, which I'm doing training courses on for our researchers. Number two, which this addresses, this addresses um, I need to know my institu institutional requirements and guidelines in terms of licensing, et cetera. And then three, I need to actually be able to um, put it into my institutional repository. And I've spent most of the summer um, querying OAI PMH servers to limited success. And what I've actually found is about a quarter of uh, UK academic institutions um, explicitly have software um, in them. Only a quarter, three quarters don't. But only a third um, can actually accept software, which is terrible. Um, I think there's a QR code sorry, for the survey. If you want to very, very quickly scan it, or the, I think the information's in the Slack channel already. I'll share it again, yes, uh, and I'll post it on Twitter as well if anyone wants to um, take part in that. Uh, yep.
Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Saranjit Kaur. Uh, I'm the co-founder of RSC Asia Association uh, and I'm a statistician by training based in India. Uh, I am here uh, to uh, share the one year, the first year journey of RSC Asia uh, with you all. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this is a pic pictorial diagram of what I started, uh, what I was thinking when uh, uh, I started this project back uh, uh, in September last year to bring RSC Asia on the global map of uh, the international RSC community. Um, so the, uh, this this is the activity or the timeline that uh, we have been doing. Uh, we uh, we are fortunate to uh, uh, celebrate uh, the first, uh, let's call the birthday of RSC Asia on the first international uh, RSC day. Uh, and since then we have been uh, working on various activities uh, for the community in Asia. Next slide, please. Uh, what has been uh, really helpful is the mentorship programs uh, by the Open Life Science uh, Cohort 4 and Cohort 5, uh, and also the mentorship by the Society of RSC, uh, which uh, uh, I and my co-founder uh, have been a part of. And uh, next slide, please. So it's uh, September, uh, a whole year for us. Uh, and uh, I'm presenting this at RSCCon, and we will be hosting our first unconference with RSC uh, in collaboration with RSC Australia uh, from September 14 to September 16. Uh, I'm here to collect more ideas of how we can grow our community. So, uh, uh, and talk to you all to learn more. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Byrne and I'm a software engineer at STFC um, and I work on the Daphne platform. So Daphne is a platform built for researchers to store data, upload software models and run workflows using those models and data all in a collaborative reproducible environment. And for this project we've introduced a new data source to the platform in the form of a living database which has been created using some of the data published by the Network Rail data feed, specifically data on the timetabling and scheduling across the whole UK rail network. Um, this project was kind of inspired by interest from potential platform users who are interested in the data but not in the format it's published in. So it's published in SIF format, which stands for common interface file, but it's anything but common because it's only actually used by network rail. So one of our main goals <laughs> was to provide the data in a more widely used transit data format called GTFS. There were some current tools that do the conversion, but of the two most prominent, one didn't work out the box and the other one actually lost some data, which is obviously not what we want. Um, so <laughs> we decided to do the conversion ourselves. So what we did is we designed a Postgres database, um, semi-based on the GTFS specification, knowing that that's how we were going to want to produce our data. And it also complemented like daily patching of new data while preventing any data loss. Um, we wrote a model that would convert the SIF into GTFS-like data frames, which were very easily written into the database. Wrote, a cron wrote and run a cron job that downloads the data every day, stores that raw data in Ceph storage, and then updates the database. And we're currently finishing off writing a new API that will query the living database. So you'll be able to provide input parameters such as start and end dates to create data subsets, which can either be downloaded or then used on the platform um, in our workflows. Hi, um, I'm Ricky Olivia. I'm with the Exeter RSC group. Um, so with this poster, I was trying to convey my experience going from a research scientist to a research software engineer. I assume many people here have had that experience. So what I tried to reflect in here was the kind of characteristics of the code when I was a scientist to compare it as I get, got better as a software developer. Um, so as a scientist, we tend to be very much um, research output and result focus, which kind of leads to bad practice, uh, which is quite evident when you try to hand over your code to, a, say, a postgraduate student that's working with you, and they have to spend lots of days, weeks, and months trying to adapt or modify the code. Yes, I'm one of those. Um, and uh, the other case is when you're trying to apply your code to a different physical scenario, not because, and the code falls over, not because it's algorithmically incompetent, but basically just because the code implementation is not very good. 
And then over time, as you gain more experience, you get you know better at coding, you start thinking a little bit about code design and how to make your life and those around you who you work with easier. And so in the third section of the poster, I just discuss what the actual benefits of good coding practice is. And then at the end, I just kind of reflect on or touch upon the difference between a software developer and an actual software engineer and some of some points that kind of uh, helped me in terms of mindset and approach to being a software engineer. That, that's it, thank you. If anybody else want to come talk tomorrow and share the experience, I'm happy to, to do so. Go turn the alarm off before it goes off. There we go. Right. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, everyone. We've got some brilliant posters this year, and thank you for keeping to time. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Can we have one more round of applause for our poster presenters, please? <laughs>